Hey guys, Monday morning in the shop here. There's a lot I want to do this week. I've got a bunch of different projects going that I'm trying to keep pushing forward. I'm trying to make this whole thing keep working, you know? So what, what do we have? I've got a bunch of billets in this bucket of diesel waiting to go into the forge. And so we're gonna fire up the forge in a little bit here and start uh, forge welding some steel together. And I think we're going to talk about some sand maya today specifically. But before I do that, I need to put in a batch of Loxa River Skinners right here. Great little all-around blade, great for field dressing and skinning. So we're going to do about, I think, five of those and get those started. And I'm just going to bring you guys along for the whole experience. And there should be quite a bit to, to think about and learn and stuff. So... Hey, I just want to ask you before we get into this, or just remind you that uh, this doesn't happen without your support. So if you're not subscribed, then please do so. Hit that like button. These Loxod River Skinners. I've been making these for quite a few years and make them out of the 52100 steel, of course. Works really well. So I'm going to get the kiln fired up here. We're going to do a normalizing cycle on this. These are stock removal blades. And so, because of that, I do a normalizing cycle to get those uh, factory factory carbides all dissolved and dispersed, to have that carbon dispersed uh, in the steel prior to moving on to the heat treat process. And we'll trace around that so we can rough the profile out here. Time to drill some holes and then we can profile it out. All right, we've got these all profiled and there's no bevel ground on them yet. And the whole design is a little bit proud. So we have a little bit of extra material to grind off the decarb. So we can go ahead and pop these in the kiln for the first step of the heat treat process. So we pull these out of the kiln, we have them hung up on the rack to air cool and still air from 1650 degrees. Reason I do this first before any other heat treating process, even though these are stock removal knives, is because as it comes from the dealer or the manufacturer, it's in a heavily spheridized state, which means it's easy to machine and drill, but the carbon in the steel is segregated into large clumps 
relatively speaking, of carbides, large carbides, and that requires a higher level of energy to break those apart and disperse the carbon evenly throughout the steel. Now we don't want all of that carbon in solution when we go into the quench from austenizing, but we do want it to be readily available for the uh, austenitizing temperature that we're going to be using, which is 1475. The next step is going to be a process anneal, and that's going to help more finely disperse the carbon into finer spiritized carbides. And that's going to be a good uh, position to move from when it comes to austenitizing. The last thing I'll do is just one uh, normalizing cycle at 1475, and that puts everything into a pearlitic state prior to austenitizing, and then we can move forward from there. This process anneal is going to take a couple hours because it needs to heat up to 1425 Fahrenheit and hold that for about 20 minutes and then cool down at a slow rate. So that'll take a while and we can start firing up the forge. <laughs> I'm just working on the last 125CR1 in mild steel billet, sand my billet that I had prepped, forge welding that up and then I'll draw it out. And in between, I actually decided, you know what, what the heck, let's try a stainless sand my billet again. This won't be the first one I've tried, but if it works, it'll be the first one that actually has worked. And the reason I, I'm gonna go ahead and try it right now is because with the uh, elevated temperatures that I've been able to achieve in this forge after modifying it a little bit, that resulted in uh, burning the last billet we did on the last video because I didn't pay attention close enough. I think we can achieve a stainless sand my forge weld. So I've got this little billet prepped up. This is 416 stainless and then the 125 CR1 in between. Clean it off with the 125 grit belt and sandwich it up, forge, or, uh, arc welded everything up so it should be airtight and we'll see if we can get it welded. So I just have to finish this one first and we will give it a go. Good 
out of the bottom of this 100 pound bottle here and starting to frost up. So gotta take care of that. Otherwise we're gonna start losing pressure when we crank it up here. of the bottle high enough so that as the uh, propane's coming out it won't freeze up. Alright, let's try this stainless steel sand by. find out we're gonna have to let this cool down grind off the arc weld beads and see what we have but in the meantime let's talk about sand mine now that we've actually made some all right let's talk about sand my for a minute here I just want to run over the uh, the process that you guys already saw if you're interested in building sand my so just to explain it to you real quickly what you already saw and First of all, you're gonna have your high carbon steel, and this is 125 CR1, which is about 1.25% carbon and very little alloying component to it. You can use a variety of different things. The easiest thing to start with would probably be 1080 or 1084 and, or 1095. And then just a, a, a mild steel cladding. You want to grind off those surfaces. 125 or 120 grit belt is uh, plenty adequate. Make sure that there's no rust or corrosion or scale and or particulates on it. I like to wipe it off with WD-40. The WD-40 is perfectly fine. That will burn off once you heat it up and actually help protect the steel. And it's totally fine to leave a nice layer of that on there. Sanders those two together. I just tacked mine at either end with the arc welder to hold them together. And you can also weld on a little handle or a long handle as as you prefer a little easier to work with I didn't do that on these so that I wouldn't have to deal with it later but it does make it a little bit more difficult to hang on to and get in and out of the forge and then you're gonna heat it up in the forge and I did use flux on these you don't have to if things things are really tight and you use diesel like you saw me doing or some form of oil like that, that can help protect the steel with a layer of soot. And I have forge welded billets without flux before with that particular method. The other option is to seal the billet all the way around with the arc or MIG welder or, or TIG welder so that there's no air getting in between the layers. So however you do that, you're gonna heat it up in the forge and getting the proper forge welding temperature is something that takes time to practice in your particular forge. As you probably saw in the last video, I overheated a billet because I made modifications to my forge that I've been using for quite some time. And I didn't take into account the modifications I made, which uh, provided for a higher heat. And so I messed up a billet. So you're just gonna have to have time and practice with that. But a couple of indicators on the heat of the billet are gonna be looking into the forge and seeing that flux boiling on, on, the, uh, on the billet if you're using flux. And then additionally, when you take the billet out of the uh, forge, you, with flux, you'll see sort of a halo uh, look or it, it looks like it's steaming, pulling it out in, into the air. And so those are a couple of indicators that are telling you that you've reached a proper heat. But at the end of the day, uh, you're going to have to heat it up in your forge, get it to where you think it's uh, supposed to be, take it out and, and try to forge weld it 
and then you know if it doesn't work maybe you need to get a little hotter or maybe you need to have a tighter billet make sure that there's no scale forming so once you've heated it up I like to set it with a hammer in this case and you're just gonna hammer a pattern so that everything is covered and you can start up the middle to uh, squeeze out any flux to the outside and then work your way down each side and a couple two or three times maybe four times at a welding heat to cover the surface area of your billet by hand with your hammer is a pretty good rule of thumb so you saw me do it I've just explained in more detail what I was doing and then once you've got a good weld set then you can start drawing the billet out and it should hold together fine for you and then you can forge a blade from it so that's that's the process that's what I do and again I can explain it to you and show it to you but you're gonna have to go do it yourself to actually gain that experience all right so let's check out this stainless steel billet grind off the the arc weld and see what we have all right well I am not optimistic the way it's responding differently to the to the heat as you can see here makes me think that we do not have a solid piece however this being stainless it could be that the high carbon is uh, oxidizing with those colors and the stainless is not I have never I haven't done a successful stainless steel semi before so I don't know but the only thing to do now is to throw it in the forge heat it up see if we can actually forge it out like this and see if it actually stays together. So another big indicator as to whether this billet actually worked is with the incandescent colors like we have here, the different levels of heat and the corresponding colors. When you're looking at a billet, forge with a billet, then the entire thing should have a consistent color. And as it cools, you shouldn't see any difference in the layers. If one side cools off dramatically more than the rest of it, that's a good indication that it's not actually attached to the rest of the billet. And actually what I'm seeing here is uh, fairly encouraging. But I don't know, so we're gonna heat this up to a decent forge welding or forging temperature and see what happens. It looks like it actually works. So far the billet is holding together as I'm drawing it out on the bias and on the flat. I've got to forge it out and forge it into a knife and finish that knife before I can really, uh, you know, call victory on this, but it's looking really good. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised. I guess it's just that little bit of extra heat that I couldn't get with the forge as it came from the uh, from the manufacturer with those open ends on it like that so it's uh it's looking promising All right, the Lockslaw River Skinners are out of the final cycle before hardening. So the next thing I'm gonna do is put a rough grind just to remove material so that we have less material at the edge to cool. And 
It's also less hardened steel to grind. Is this absolutely necessary? No, in this stock dimensions, the steel will still harden adequately, I think. But save a little bit on the grinding belts and that's a good thing too. Well, this 416 stainless is much stiffer than mild steel. Normally you can just uh, curl that up, bend it over and everything, and all that scale comes off. Although, <laughs> I guess there's not going to be as much scale with the stainless steel, so didn't think about that. Um, I don't know how this is actually going to cold forge either, that being the case. Well, I think I might just... Yeah, I'll probably go a little more there. Well, I was able to get holes in it with the carbide burr, but the stainless steel did not soften hardly at all. So this 416 stainless, I believe, is a Martensitic stainless steel, which means it does harden, obviously. It's not a blade steel or anything like that. It doesn't have that kind of carbon content in it, but it's not going to probably work for doing it the way I was trying to uh, work it with the uh, traditional Japanese Sanmai bladesmithing techniques. I might have to go with a 300 series. I believe that's austenitic stainless, which means it never actually converts to martensite. No matter what you do with it, it stays in the austenitic, austenitic phase, so it's soft. So I'm going to have to go with that, but we're going to get a thermocycle on this because I wasn't able to actually uh, cold forge it for uh, grain refinement. So we'll do that, and then we will go ahead and water quench it. All right, so I'm going to do a water quench on this, and... I'm gonna apply some of my super secret clay mixture, AKA uh, anti-skill coating. And the only reason I'm doing this is to try to even out the cooling action of the water, which is by nature not a very even uh, coolant. And so the clay coating traditionally actually helps with evening the cooling rate across the uh, blade so that it's more even. 
Did that make sense? I feel like I said evening a lot. Anyway, I'm not sure if this is a great way to do it. Dipping it would probably be better. But it's a pretty thick, pretty thick coat on there. Anyway, I'm going to let that dry and we should be good to go. Okay, hopefully it's not a pretzel. All right, I'm not seeing any D lambs, anything like that. Maybe should have had it in the water for one more second. That's why I went ahead and and uh, cool it off just a little more in the oil, so there wasn't any extra heat. this thing and see what happens. All right guys, this is super exciting. This will be the first ever stainless steel semi blade to come out of my shop, ever. So I've got this finished ground. It's looking really good. And after the uh, complete heat treating process, the 416 stainless here does is soft, is softer, and you know you can feel that on the grinder, and also um, you can you can bend it a little bit as you would expect with a uh, mild steel cladding or any other soft material. So that that that's all working fine. It just doesn't seem to work to process it quite the same way in the uh, forging and then drilling and stuff. So that, uh, that all is something that I'll have to look into a little bit more, but pretty happy with how it's turning out. So I'm gonna do a brass rod test real quick. I've got this ground to 6,000, so nice thin edge, and we'll check it out on the brass rod. So what I'm doing with this is simply flexing the edge, and you'll hopefully you can see it. I'll probably change the camera angle if that doesn't work, but I'm gonna press down on the brass rod and in the light, you can see it bow up like that. And if it returns to its original shape, it, turns, it goes back straight, that's a good indication that it's of a sufficient hardness. If it were to bend, obviously that would be too soft. If it were to crack or break, that would be too hard. So we've got good flex and good return and everything looks really good. And this is not what the brass rod test is, but obviously it should be able to shave off and cut brass. This is not sharpened yet, it's just the uh, the 90 degree edge of that steel right there. But obviously the edge steel is hard enough to uh, easily do that, so there you go. I'm gonna put Coca Bolo handle skills on this knife and uh, my little tooling slab here is great for sanding the scales flat, but I got some clay and epoxy gunk on it. I usually have a piece of uh, stock, steel stock sitting around here that's a drop, you know, just a, an end piece, but I turned it into a knife, so now I have nothing to scrape my, uh, maybe this will work. All right guys, I'm gonna show you a picture of the whole knife in just a second here. And this one will be up for sale on the website. So if you want to own the 
very first ever stainless steel sand my knife out of Fire Creek Forge. Go on the website there. Probably won't last long, but uh, this was a uh, a welcome detour to this week. I got to get back to Locksaw River Skinners and the rest of the billets that I need to forge weld up this week. So I'm going to leave it here. Appreciate you guys watching, and we will see you on the next video.